I would like to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP, and we want to thank you for your continued support and input into our work. These are both crucial to our success. We are also um, uh, uh, thrilled to welcome our presenters from the Bentley Library. Um, and uh, before we get uh, started, however, I'm going to turn things over to Senior Program Officer Chela Weber, who is going to uh, set us up with a couple of contextual remarks. So take it away, Chela. And I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, Chela. Thanks, thanks, okay, Marilee. there you go. I, I, got, I, I got it. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you, Marilee, for the introduction. Um, so I'm just going to give a, a little bit of a brief, some brief context here, and then turn it on, turn it over to our panelists. So, um, so OCLC Research um, uh, has a long history of working in archives, special and distinctive collections in research libraries. Um, as some of our folks who've been with us for a while will know. Um, and we, we work in special collections because they're an important site of knowledge creation um, made possible by the library's commitment to stewardship of their distinctive collections. And because the unique nature of the material in special collections can make um, scaling work with them a challenge, we, we work to try to identify areas of common need and patterns of innovation that can help libraries scale up learning and improve their expertise kind of across the partnership with these collections. Um, last year, we released the research, library, uh, research and Learning Agenda for Archives, Special and Distinctive Collections, which was created uh, with a, through a collaborative, collaborative process with many of the members of the partnership. And, and it articulates sort of shared challenges and opportunities that research libraries are facing in the um, special and distinctive collection sphere and su suggest some approaches to working together on them. Um, the agenda is guiding our own work in this area, and, um, and we also hope that it's going to serve to frame some larger conversations and, and spur action across the field. So as part of our work in response to the agenda, um, we're presenting a number of webinars that respond to issues surfaced, uh, surfaced during our work creating it. Um, There we go. Um, so one of the one of the main one of the things that the agenda um, surfaced was that um, it recognized that there's this convergence going on of priorities and needs between special collections and sort of the research library pop proper, um, and then, and that there's a, an effort to align our work and our, articulate our value in special collections kind of along tandem lines with the, the larger library. Um, and part of this reflects a shift uh, that's already been underway but continues to build in, in special collections of, of sort of building and articulating the value of archives and special collections, not just via talking about um, the collections themselves, but via services and collaborations and engagement with a full range of stakeholders, um, colleagues, users, and others across the library. Um, and we're and this is just one full quote from talking about this, but we're really we're aligning, we're building allies, we're sharing the important knowledge that we have within special collections, um, important and specialized knowledge, and then sort of identifying opportunities to reach larger audiences than, than we have in the past. And of course, one of the important ways that special collections do this is through serving the core teaching mission of the um, parent organizations that many research libraries serve. Um, and the, the um, so in talking about teaching with special collections, the agenda, uh, really recognizes that there's been an important um, there have been important and kind of complementary shifts in approach to teaching in both libraries and in special collections um, that the the 2015 publication of the ACR ACRL framework for information literacy in higher ed kind of co codified a shift of emphasis in library instruction toward information literacy and threshold concepts and also toward collaborative relationships between faculty and librarians 
and that instruction in archives and special collections has followed a similar trajectory, kind of shifting away from the the sort of old school show and tell of treasures to a really pedagogically grounded approach that leverages primary source materials to engage students in critical thinking and information evaluation. Um, and that realignment was uh, supported by, uh, there's been a, a sort of a really a bounty of publications in this area in the last couple of years, and of course the relatively newly adopted guidelines for primary source literacy. Um, so I was really interested in Michigan's work um, because it it went about about trying to address these needs in a really programmatic way. So thinking about that scaling work, thinking about building allies, sharing that specialized knowledge, and then ultimately kind of um, building a broader uh, community of people, a broader impact in creating and assessing the kind of value that we're hoping to to build and to bring to our institutions. Um, so I was really excited that um, that our presenters agreed to, to uh, be with us here today. Um, so uh, let me introduce them. Um, and today we will be hearing from um, Terry McDonald, who is uh, the director, and uh, Cinda Nossiger, who is the archivist for academic programs and outreach, both from the Bentley Historical Library at the University of Michigan. Um, so I'm going to uh, put on their slides and turn presentation over privileges over to them. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Terry and Cinda. Thanks. Hi, everyone. This is Terry McDonald. Hi, this is Cinda Nostiger. Thanks for being here. And uh, we're very excited today to uh, share the information about so many exciting things that are going on in the field, uh, bo both here and elsewhere, of, of teaching with primary sources. Before we start uh, in the details of that information, though, I wanted to start with the question, why is this work important for us to do? Uh, and it seems like a roundabout path to this answer, but it starts by thinking about the famous book by Daniel Kahneman, the psychologist and economist, called Thinking Fast and Slow. And in that book, Kahneman identifies two modes of thinking, fast and slow. Uh, and the fast mode is the kind of unconscious, automatic uh, thinking that we do all the time. It lacks reflection. It's the home of stereotypes and unwarranted conclusions. But sadly, uh, psychologists have discovered we're here in this fast mode most of the time. And examples of this might be Google Knowing and certainly Twitter, uh, which is, of course, the, 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 the throne of fast thinking. Uh, Kahneman suggests there's another mode called slow thinking. Uh, which is attention to the effortful mental activities that demand it. And this region is about agency, choice, concentration, and interpretation. But sadly, we're only rarely there, and Kahneman argues that we would all be a lot better off if we were there in the slow mode more often. Now, in his really interesting book called The Internet of Us, Michael Patrick Lynch has used this distinction uh, to help us think about the role of slow thinking and teaching slow thinking in the democratic process. So the point he wants to make is that citizenship demands slow thinking. Uh, he argues that knowing is having a correct belief, getting it right, having a true opinion that is grounded or justified and which can therefore guide our action. And he goes on to say that institutions that facilitate and encourage the construction of grounded belief, the interpretation of sources, data, et cetera, are doing the work of democracy. And so I think it's important to say that in teaching with primary sources, we are moving ourselves and our students onto the terrain of slow thinking. And in getting them there, uh, we are actually doing something important, not only for the intellectual life of the university, uh, but also for our democracy uh, writ large. So our challenge then in thinking about how to teach with primary sources, and in particular, teaching better with primary sources, is to produce an experience of the production of grounded belief based on primary sources that engages effortful thinking and empowers our students to be autonomous operators in the world of hard-won knowledge production and evaluation. And both of us are delighted to be reporting today on events here and elsewhere that suggest there's a tremendous amount of great activity moving in this direction. So I want to start uh, by telling you about a class that I believe demonstrates the benefits of working with archives that Terry has just articulated. The faculty member who taught this course, History 399, 
uh, environmental activism in Michigan, participated in our Engaging the Archives faculty seminar, um, which I'll talk about later. And he will be the first to say that, this, that his participation in the seminar changed the shape and plan of the course. And the result was very successful. So this class was part of a project within the University of Michigan's History Department's public history track. Officially known as Michigan in the World, Local and Global Stories, History 399 has been offered at least once a year since 2015. Individual faculty members choose a topic for each iteration. Michigan in the World aims to expose undergraduates to public history as a discipline and provide them with an opportunity to engage in extensive original research in campus archives. And each Michigan in the World cohort begins the semester with the explicit goal of creating a public online exhibit. And um, this is just a screenshot from the exhibit. The link, I think, is in the chat, so you can go there and take a deeper look if you'd like. The course was well planned um, and deeply collaborative. Professor Matt Lassiter participated in the Bentley's faculty seminar the previous semester. He then spent hours in our reading room over the summer looking at materials in consultation with archivists. We discussed um, in the seminar and later when and how to bring his students to the Bentley and how to scaffold their learning so that they would be ready to successfully complete the website by the end of the semester. The class came for their first visit to the Bentley during their third class period, so really at the beginning of the semester, after doing a bit of preliminary work about finding sources on databases and doing some secondary reading on the topic. The intention of that first session at the Bentley was to build on what they had been doing in class, identifying and beginning to evaluate sources. We, the professor and I, modeled how to approach a folder within a box and asked asking sort of the kinds of questions of documents that a historian might ask. We talked about how to think about which folders to look at, so sort of really thinking about um, how to approach archives at a very basic level. Um, the next week the class returned for a library session that included a discussion with our, about audiovisual resources and copyright with our AV archivist and also included structured research time. And then the class came back a third time about a month later for another research session. Um, students were doing independent research, but they did it in our classroom space. So both the faculty member and I were there to sort of answer questions and um, help them along as needed. Um, by then, by that point, they had begun building the website, um, but they continued to come to the Bentley in small groups for the rest of the semester to continue their research in the reading room. The final website contains uh, sections concerning the origins of the environmental movement, Earth Day 1970, Michigan activism, air and water politics, and legacies. In addition to the student's written analysis, the website contains a variety of types of sources, photographs, documents, newspapers, audio and film clips, as well as clips from the oral history interviews that students conducted with some environmental activists. We measured the success of this class in several ways, though we didn't execute a formal assessment. We instead evaluated the class based on data gathered from Aon, our circulation management system, on our observations, from reflective discussions with Professor Lassiter, and from the learning demonstrated on the website itself. The data from Aon quantified the work um, in which the students engaged. In addition to the 12 hours of class time they spent with archivists at the library, the eight students in the class spent a total of 88 hours doing independent research in the Bentley's reading room. Students used more than 600 Bentley documents to support the arguments made in the text of their website. And while this is certainly a testament to both the professors and the students' work ethics, um, the ability to locate and synthesize such an impressive number of relevant sources demonstrates that the students mastered the intended learning objectives for the course. The research findings, the website, and the relationships that formed as a result of this semester were so impressive that Lassiter's approach has been inspiring for other research-intensive classes. We encourage professors to plan with archivists in advance um, 
in advance of the semester how often and at what strategic points they will bring their students to the Bentley. So students will have an opportunity to build, this, build skills from multiple sessions. The class also helps students connect their own interests in environmental history to activism. The website contains a page of student reflections about why they were interested in the class, what they learned, and how it impacted them more personally. Additionally, three undergraduates continued archival research after their semester ended. They worked for the Ecology Center, which is a local institution whose records are at the Bentley, and those records were used heavily in the course and in the website. One, one student even went on to teach a one-credit honors class um, using the Bentley's materials that was also on environmental activism in Michigan. And she collaborated with archivists to plan a session to, at the Bentley in which students learned to analyze primary sources. So there's this nice chain of um, student becoming the teacher um, that, I, that is really um, gratifying. Um, the History 399 students also won a prize for this project. It was second place for single term projects in the Michigan Library's Undergraduate Research Award Program. So overall, this class is a really great example, I think, of um, making what happens when you make time to teach students to think slowly and to find their own connections to the past. I think if you look at that, if you have a chance to look at the website, there's a lot in there about um, that speaks directly to these questions about uh, democratic citizenship. So now I want to think a bit about context. Terry has offered us sort of a very broad context for the type of work that we do. And I want to offer a slightly more narrow view of what I see happening in the field um, among archivists and librarians who teach with primary sources. And then I'm going to talk about the research that we've been doing at the Bentley in terms of trying to better understand the impact of teaching with archives on students, faculty, and archivists. Um, my assessment of what's happening in the field comes from the symposium that the Bentley held in November 2018 on teaching undergraduates with archives. The symposium brought together around 200 participants from 36 states and four countries for three and a half days of 22 sessions, all about how to teach better with archival materials. The sessions and conversations during that symposium offered a window into what's happening around the country and beyond, what archivists and special collections librarians who teach are thinking about, as well as the opportunities and challenges we face. We are also in the process of putting together a book featuring selected, selected essays from the symposium, which is due out in November. And so I'm just going to run through some of the themes that emerged from the symposium and the book project, as well as some other interesting things that I have come across. Um, so the state of the field in five themes, uh, new programs, need for professional development, um, assessment, collaboration, and commitment. So in their American Archivist article from last spring, um, Anderberg and a series of other um, authors wrote that between 2014 and May 2017, there were 140 jobs with a teaching tag that were posted on ArchivesGig. So that's a lot. That's a lot of a great increase in um, jobs that require some amount of teaching. And as the number of institutions who have dedicated people who teach with primary sources increases, there's an interest in creating stronger instructional programs at, that in, at an institutional level. So rather than designing individual courses in an ad hoc kind of way, there's a desire to think more broadly, especially as we think about being able to manage the scale of an increased teaching load. So just exactly what Shayla was saying. Um, Additionally, there's a strong interest in developing a wider community of practice across institutions that would encompass archivists, librarians, curators, faculty, K-12 educators, and even museum educators, basically anyone with an interest in teaching with primary sources. There have been some efforts at this by both the rare books and manuscripts section of the ACRL and the reference and outreach section of the Society of American Archivists. For example, the Instruction and Outreach Committee of RBMS and SAA's RAO Teaching with Primary Sources Committee have collaborated on some projects together, like the Teaching with Primary Sources Unconference and the Resource Bank. 
the Joint Task Force on Primary Source Literacy is a great example of how we can come together across professional organizations to work towards a larger community of practice. As the numbers of people who are teaching uh, with primary sources increases, there's also a need for professional development. Um, there's a desire for learning the skills to teach pedagogically informed ethical class sessions using active learning methods, as well as the resources to support such professional development. And there are some great programs around the country that are engaging in this kind of professional development, such as Dartmouth Librarian's Active Learning Institute for Special Collections and Archives, the SAA's Workshop on Active Learning, Robin Katz's numerous library juice trainings, and others. And then additionally, there are calls among pract practitioners for making instruction with primary sources part of the curriculum in libraries and information programs. And I would add that part of, part of what this professional development needs is not just places to get the professional development, but the time and money for um, librarians and archivists who are in these positions to be able to do that work. Teaching is a, is a skill that takes time to develop. Um, and so it's, it's great when there are opportunities for newer or people who just want to in, gain more skills to be able to do that. Um, ethically teaching with primary sources is, is more recently getting a greater buzz in the field, though many individuals have been thinking about this for a long time. Um, there's really interesting work being done at the Harry Ransom Center in Austin, at the Newberry Library, and at Kent State. Um, the Rubenstein Library at Duke has developed an instruction code of ethics that could serve as a model for other institutions to think about how we um, are being as ethical with our materials as we possibly can. The next slide here is about assessment. Um, and this is a third theme um, that the community seems very interested in, if not quite sure how to do. Um, so way back in 2018, Magia Kraus, Beth Yako, Wendy Duff, and Joan Cherry started writing about the need for assessment in archival teaching. And since then, there have been numerous other calls for better assessment of learning with primary sources, but there hasn't been one way that sort of swept everyone along with it. And instead, there seems to be a lot of experimentation in different methods and a general lack of certainty about whether or not any of them are working. So assessment continues to be an area that we as a community could and should develop. There is a strong desire to collaborate with, with colleagues, with faculty members, and with others who are teaching in, uh, with primary sources. And I think those collaborations can take a lot of different forms. For example, um, librarians at Brandeis and at the University of Rochester are creating collaborative programs to cross-train special collections librarians and subject area librarians to teach together. The Atlanta University Center has created the Galleries, Libraries, Archives, and Museums Center for Collaborative Teaching and Learning at the Woodruff Library, which specializes in object-based learning. And at the University of Georgia, the Special Collections Library collaborated with the Center for Teaching and Learning <coughs> to create a teaching fellows program for faculty interested in teaching with archives. And here at the Bentley, as I've mentioned, we also have a faculty program that I'll talk about in a few minutes. The final theme that I just want to touch on is um, commitment and, and pride in our work. The commitment to teaching better, to sharing our excitement about our collections with students, to teaching pedagogically informed in informed ways, um, all of that was palpable at the symposium and it is embedded in every single conversation I have with colleagues who do this work. And that, that pride can be motivating, can help us achieve our goals as individual institutions and as a field. It can help us advocate for ourselves and the work we do. Maybe we can use assessment to help justify that pride, for example. Um, as Terry mentioned, this is good, important, and pressing work we are doing, and we should recognize that ourselves and help others to recognize it as well. So that is one view of what is happening in the field right now. 
Um, and I want to narrow our focus even a bit more to talk about what we're doing at the Bentley. In 2015, the Bentley applied for and received a substantial grant from the University of Michigan's Provost Office. The grant was part of the university's third century initiative, a project to develop innovative, multidisciplinary teaching and scholarship approaches. The grant funds a semester-long seminar that brings faculty and archivists together to collaborate on the development of course syllabi which draw on Bentley materials. The goals of the seminar are collaboration with faculty in which archivists, faculty, and research scientists think together about how best to teach with archival materials, recognizing that archivists are not necessarily experts in teaching and faculty are not necessarily experts in archives. And we believe that together we could advance pedagogical uses of archives. There's also a research component to this grant that examines the effects of the seminar on faculty, archivists, and at this point, and to a lesser and more limited degree, on students. We've run two semesters of the seminar since then and are just finishing up our third. The seminar has had a positive impact on how our classes are constructed and implemented. At the end of the semester, 16 faculty members will have participated in the Bentley Seminar. We invite faculty to participate and they receive a stipend. Because one of the goals of the seminar is to expand the disciplines that use the Bentley, we're invited, we've invited faculty from across areas um, all around campus, such as art history and architecture, art and design, American culture, African American studies, Judaic studies, television, film, and media, music, theater, and dance, philosophy, women's studies, and history. The seminar has generated 11 iterations of classes. 15 archivists have also participated from all areas across the Bentley. This includes our university field archivist, athletics archivist, digital curators, metadata specialists, collections manager, as well as reference archivists, and the project archivists who participate in teaching. The director, associate director, and I facilitate and participate in each seminar as well. The research team's lead investigator, Patricia Garcia, interviews the faculty and archivists before and after the seminar, and the faculty are interviewed again after teaching their classes. These interviews show the importance of close collaboration with archivists, particularly in planning a course, but, all, but also throughout it. Our interviews have indicated some important changes in the perceptions faculty have about archivists and archives as a result of the seminar. The first types of changes are related to design of classes. One of the things that we've gotten faculty to think differently about through the seminar is that students need to spend more time with archivists and archives. One faculty member noted that they had changed the structure of their class so that students feel more comfortable contacting the archivist and the work of the archivist is built into the core structurally in a way that it wasn't before. Increasing contact with archivists and archives can happen in a lot of ways. Classes might come to the Bentley more than once so that we don't need to teach all the skills the students will need in a single class session. So you can think about that class that we did with Matt Lassiter where Students came three times, and each time we were sort of focused on something different. Um, Bentley archivists also might visit classes. For example, in a class on Jewish experience at the University of Michigan, a colleague and I spent about an hour during their first day talking about what primary sources are and how to begin to interpret them in their own classroom. Sometimes courses have students present final projects with Bentley archivists in the audience, and the archivists are able to provide feedback and guidance to the students. The Bentley has also placed an embedded archivist in two courses. The archivist attended almost all of the class sessions, read the course material, and participated in discussion. Um, this additional time with students allowed the students to form a deeper relationship with the archivist than in other classes. And these are all just examples of opportunities for students to connect more with archivists and with our materials. After the seminar, faculty are more concretely aware of the various roles archivists can play in their classes. 
For example, they see the contribution archivists can make in terms of syllabi, timelines, and topics, including when it makes the most sense for students to encounter the archives. One faculty member noted that after the seminar, she would work much more closely with archivists at the Bentley in constructing the syllabus and be much more deliberative about tapping on them at different touch points. Another stated that getting the archivist involved when you're planning the course is more important than anything they may do once the course starts. Other perceptual changes relate to the way that archivists and faculty can collaborate. The seminar demonstrated that archivists had expertise that could be put to pedagogical purposes, and the faculty learned that other archivists besides the instruction team could be tapped for teaching. For example, one faculty member has requested our Michigan Historical Field Archivist to come to her classes and talk about how we are currently collecting material in Detroit. While faculty learned that they can draw on expertise of archivists throughout the Bentley, they also reported appreciating that there was one person who could facilitate that contact. In their post-seminar and post-class interviews, faculty focused as much on the relationships they had with archivists as on the material in the archives, and that seems to be a positive improvement. At the same time, Archivists have gained a deeper understanding of pedagogy. One reference archivist stated, but I think the biggest part is really understanding that I've never made a syllabus and understanding all the work that goes into it and how they're thinking about where the visit falls within the semester and how they know how their students learn and how their students work and just seeing the deeper level of everything it takes to plan a class to come to the Bentley. The seminar also gave archivists a chance to demonstrate their expertise. This happened in a couple of ways. First, in terms of knowledge about the collections. One stated in his post-seminar interview, just being familiar with the library's collections was probably the biggest asset I brought to it. Archivists also demonstrated their expertise in terms of knowledge about archival processes that could be brought into classes, such as fieldwork and copyright questions. Still, archivists also became more aware of what faculty and students need to best make use of the archives. They learned in the seminar how faculty use or do not use finding aids with classes for their example, or for example, and this informs how archivists think about adapting and making accessible description tools. One archivist stated, I think more about my end users after the seminar. So the seminar has helped broaden archivist perspectives on the impact of their work while also reaffirming for them its importance. Finally, student impact. We wanted to look at the impact of learning with archival materials on students by assessing the students who were in the classes that the seminar faculty created. So we are hoping to better understand how the faculty's focus on teaching with archives affects student learning. We decided to do this by looking at um, a select number of transferable skills and settled on five, intercultural engagement, um, creativity, ethical reasoning, communication, and self-agency. The research team created a pre and post test which had students working with a response from a 1924 alumni survey. That year, the Alumni Association sent surveys to all the women who had attended the University of Michigan since they were admitted in 1870. And we chose a survey that was particularly rich in information, and the assessment tool asked students to answer questions about the survey, questions that were designed to get at those competencies I listed. The method was a bit tricky for a number of reasons. There were sort of low response rates, especially for the post-test. Um, there was difficulty demonstrating cognality. Um, we were using qualitative methods and then coding the student responses based on a rubric. Um, and you know, there's always sort of interop interoperable. Um, I lost my word. Variation. <laughs> Right, right, thank you. Um, so all of those sort of figuring all of that out and, and getting the, the method um, down is something that we're still working towards. Um, but some preliminary analysis of one class's response shows that student scores showed the greatest increase in intercultural engagement. And intercultural engagement included attributes like intercultural curiosity, 
uh, integrating diverse perspectives, and an absence of presentism. And as we coded the students' results, we looked for students to ask complex questions about other cultures, in this case, cultures in the past, um, to seek out and articulate answers to those questions that reflect multiple cultural perspectives, to identify and recognize the value of multiple perspectives, and to thoroughly discuss, explain, and qualify them and to make thorough connections between the present and the past using a nuanced understanding of historical context. So we were testing for, a, we were looking for quite a bit of, of um, competence um, in the scores that, rate, that were the highest. Um, so we're still working on how best to use this tool and how best to assess student learning, um, but it's been an exciting and interesting project so far. And I'm gonna turn this back to Terry. So there are a lot of uh, paths forward that are emerging. Most of these, uh, Senda has mentioned, for example, the young conferences, the training programs at various places, uh, the, um, our own conference, and these websites are just another way to um, access that information. Um, we found a lot of useful, uh, we got a lot of good out of the shared Zotero bibliography that uh, people can join. Um, and that's basically sort of crowdsourced and a lot of interesting um, articles come out of that and we use that um, for background of our work. Around the country, as Senator pointed out, positions in archives specializing in education and outreach are proliferating. I think it's important now speaking as an administrator to say that simply adding teaching to another full-time job is not the path forward. Um, there needs to be much more consideration of the amount of time and training it takes to be an effective guide for teaching in the archives. And therefore, the more these, these positions are defined as predominantly doing teaching, uh, rather than doing everything else plus teaching, uh, the better off uh, we're going to be. Uh, and then, of course, the process that Cindy has just talked about, there is, in our experience, nothing more powerful than simply getting uh, archival faculty and departmental faculty in the same room for some period of time to discuss pedagogy. And one of the surprising findings, and this is relevant for all of our research libraries among the faculty, is how rarely they get a chance to spend that much time just talking about any kind of teaching, uh, let alone teaching with primary sources. One of the first products of our research project has been a survey of the literature, and I just pointed this out because it's another big source of bibliography on what's going on out there, but as you can see, um, this clearly tracks uh, the increasing uh, interest in this topic and the fact that more and more um, is being written about it, and we found much of that to be extremely useful for our project. Now, there are a few obstacles, as there is in any major change uh, in an academic profession. Um, and that is, first of all, that our own professional training and instincts uh, can impede our understanding of where students start. Um, this is true both on the side of the departmental faculty and on the side of archival faculty. Um, if we think that our finding aids are as clear as a bell to undergraduate students, uh, we may be living in a kind of dream world um, as far as that goes. Uh, similarly, if the course faculty think that students can come here and in a half an hour master the information finding skills necessary to succeed, uh, they're not living in the real world either. And one of the very most important things about working with students in the archives is for them to, feel, to get a feeling of success and not frustration. So lowering the barriers to a successful experience in the archives is key uh, to making this change, and we all need to think about the ways in which we take for granted certain kinds of knowledge that students couldn't possibly have. A second thing is time pressure, and there are versions of this both on the part of archival faculty and teaching faculty. Uh, our own desire for coverage is an enemy sometimes to the amount of time students need to have a successful experience in the archives. Faculty frequently want to cover a big topic or a big time period. Uh, archivists frequently want to sort of uh, open up a giant collection for students to work in. Both of these are likely mistakes. Uh, you really have to sacrifice some coverage, some content, some sheer amount of material in order to get students to focus and have uh, success in that, in that way. Uh, and then finally, it's just a failure to understand the requirements of a successful partnership between archival faculty and departmental faculty. And here the takeaway, of course, is the traditional one-shot archival orientation may be the absolute enemy of our success. Um, there's no doubt that success in the archives that in fact will redound to the success of the class takes time. 
And unless we can think about how we can decompose the assignments, spend more time lowering the barriers to information access in the archives, um, and making this experience work, as for example in the course that, that Cinda outlined, um, that's, that's the requirement for progress. And so um, many archivists call these one-shot visits drive-bys, uh, and I think that's probably very true. Uh, and it's really important then to have that understanding of what a partnership might be like. And in particular, on, on the side of departmental faculty, it requires a long lead time for planning um, and not a kind of appearance uh, in the class uh, at the very last minute. So these are some things that we all have to uh, focus on to move forward, I think. Um, but I want to say that the benefit of this work for ourselves, for the enrichment of our careers and our places, for the feeling of success in the archives and for the success of our partners uh, in the regular classroom is really significant. And then beyond that, as I said at the beginning, um, this kind of work is so important for the kind of thinking that we need for our country as well. And so all these reasons, I think, are inspiring for us to make more progress on all the fronts that are already opened and to work as hard as we can to overcome the obstacles that still remain. Super. Thank you so much for your presentation. That was uh, really excellent. We have uh, a number of questions queued up, but I want to remind people, uh, if you have a question, an observation, something to share, uh, please don't hold back. Be sure to uh, enter that into chat. Be sure that the um, it's set to all participants. Paradoxically, all, all uh, attendees, the panelists don't see that. So if you've sent something to all um, attendees rather than all participants, um, I can't see it, so uh, it's not going to wake its way into the Q&A. Uh, so we'll get started um, with uh, some questions. Mary Johnson asks, um, or observes and then asks, uh, K through 12 education standards have changed significantly in recent years to include learning through primary sources. Are you seeing undergraduate students today with primary source analysis skills? Uh, I think that the um, so we, uh, one of our research partners is in the School of Education here, and I recommend working with them on this because they've spent a lot of time with it. But I, I think that the, um, that, that translation process, even though K through 12 has been working on it a lot longer than, ironically, than in some cases we have, um, has yet to completely occur. Um, and in part, that's because the, the ways that um, most of the uh, teaching done in the K through 12 schools is with, usually with pre-curated materials. Uh, whereas the experience on the campus is always is, is usually with with actually working in the archive itself, and that that kind of contextual difference I think does make a difference. Adding to that, then the level of sophistication that the that the teaching faculty expect, um, all these things make the easy transferability of K through 12 skills among the students um, kind of complicated. On the other hand, uh, the teaching practices and experience of the K through 12 teachers are powerful in training university level faculty to work uh, with these materials. Uh, for example, most university level faculty don't think that modeling the interpretation of a primary source would be a kind of important way of, of teaching. Uh, obviously, K through 12 uh, teachers do that all the time. So surprisingly, one of the most popular elements of our training seminar for university faculty is having someone mo explain to them how modeling works in the K through 12 classroom. Thank you so much. Um, there was a question about slide 19. Um, and I had this, this same question. This is from uh, Rebecca Johnson Melvin. Um, why did self in the pre and post course evaluations, mm -hmm. why did self-agency go down? That's a great question. <laughs> Thank you for navigating back to that slide, yeah. We are... What, what, what's, what's meant by self-agency? Was there a definition for these that's beyond so, just what's here? Um, The way that we were thinking about self-agency in this context was evaluation of we, we looked at um, attributes of, of ability to evaluate potential sources and evaluation of the source. So to, to have student, one of the questions that we used that was specifically evaluating self-agency was a question at the end of the, of the um, survey that said, um, 
if you were, it, I think we gave students a choice of two other collections that they could look at um, that were related to this alumni survey that they looked at. One was a one was one about the history of, or it was another women's collection on campus, and one was a collection about sororities. And we just asked which one of these would be where you would go next and why. And so we were trying to think about um, were students considering sort of the history of the problem and the issues that were that were coming up? Um, were they able to give us logical reasoning for their answer? Um, were they thinking about the feasibility of their solution? Um, were they making judgments about the, the source's validity or its limitations or strengths? So that's what we were sort of um, trying to get um, with that self-agency question. I think one of the things that, and Terry, you can correct me or add something. One of the things that we have considered about this is that um, students maybe had a higher level of confidence in their self-agency at the beginning, and one of the reasons it may have changed somewhat ironically is that they actually learned to be a little bit more um, skeptical of their own presumptions. Um, so, I mean, that's sort of putting a positive spin on this, um, but maybe by the end it was not that they, um, it was just that they were more reticent um, than they were at the beginning. But just to say, all of these things are proxies for what we were trying to sort of get to. Um, and so one thing we're just obviously, one thing we're working on now that we've had several rounds of using the instrument um, is whether these results are, are, are the result of, 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 of the actual finding or they're artifactual to the way that we made the approach. So I guess one, one thing about evaluation is it never stops. That is, you're constantly trying to evaluate the students, but at the same time, you have to evaluate yourself and your own methods. And we're in the course right now of, of taking a look at um, the student evaluation part of the project. Yeah. Okay, super. So maybe the students were just, uh, uh, they, they didn't know what they didn't know. They were a little more confident to start with, but. One possibility. Yeah, that's one yeah. possibility. Yeah, super. Okay, um, this is a question from Marjorie Sly. During the, um, can you define ethical reasoning? Uh, ethical use is referenced in frequently in the PSL guidelines. So I can again tell you how we were thinking about ethical reasoning in this, in this study, um, and we again had sort of elements of this included elements of historical empathy and ethical issue recognition. Um, so. In the survey that they were looking at, it was a the survey was taken. It was uh, um, written by an African American woman um, who was one of the few African American students at Michigan during the time that she was here, um, and her survey revealed some of her feelings about being both a woman and being a woman of color. Um, and so we were asking students to sort of or we were trying to get students to, or trying to see if students were recognizing um, her, um, her relationship to those issues, the, what she said about it, um, how she understood her position. Um, so sort of thinking about um, the people who were involved and being empathetic towards the people who were involved, um, and then just even just recognizing that there was something, that there was an issue there that had ethical implications. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's sort of where we were coming from in this, in this survey. Uh, yeah, so um, here is a question from Claire Withers. Did you use fast and slow thinking in the seminar? Yes, we start. Uh, we didn't use the book. No one, no one could use the book. As, as I think everyone knows, fast and slow thinking is an encyclopedia, uh, and so it's vast, phenomenally interesting, but vast. Um, so we used the framework in the seminar, but not not the book itself. Okay, great. 
Um, and uh, here is a question. So there's been some um, some help uh, for this person uh, in the in the chat already, which is marvelous. But we'll get your take on it as well. Uh, so Mari Nakahara um, says, I work at the Library of Congress where we don't have direct interactions with faculty. Do you have any ideas or suggestions about how the library can engage with professors? I begin to reach out to some professors, but anything else? And I think this would be um, for those who work at our um, independent research libraries and who are not in a campus setting. This is this is very relevant. So how to how to do outreach if you're not uh, if you don't have the privilege of being in a campus setting. Well, you know, I, I want to say there's a great uh, report on the uh, on the way that the the Brooklyn, uh, mm -hmm. the, the Brooklyn Historical Society did that, and I, I would start by actually looking at that. That's by Sarah, I think. Um, so that's, I would start with this. There was a report on outreach, and this is also a non-university-based program, right. um, and they did a great deal of outreach. Now, of course, they were lucky because they were in the New York area. I, I would suggest starting kind of where you are, so um, starting with the institutions in D.C., of which there are many, and trying to kind of bring them in, mm -hmm. connect them, mm -hmm. perhaps have mm -hmm. a have a reception, you know, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, I think it's. I want to just be frank about it. It's obviously for a university-based archive, the the outreach is 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 easier, frankly, and and more kind of containable. But for those that are not, I think the main thing is once again this question of how can you lower the barrier. I mean, how, how does someone, let's take, in, in, who's teaching at George Washington, realize that it's not going to just it's not going to be impossible. Or, to actually find something really useful for the class without spending a semester of searching. Um, so I think part of this is simply getting people to know the place and encouraging them to come to the place and identifying a contact person who will help guide them through the collections. Mm -hmm. I think these things have all been important and can be used by the freestanding archives as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the um, report that Terry was referring to, it is part of the teacharchives.org website um, that they did at the Brooklyn Historical Library. Yeah, yeah somebody put up the site. Um, yeah, I was a part of the early uh, forming of that. It's a great program, and there's a lot of um, good resources on that website, both about from the archives perspective and from the educators perspective. Great. OK, we have a couple more questions. Um, can you elaborate on the statement regarding calls in the field to include teaching with primary sources in LIS curriculum? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, it's just that there has been, this mostly came out of our seminar, I mean, our symposium, that um, it was a topic of conversation. It was the topic of some presentations that um, there is a, and there's been some research done. Um, again, that I think that it's in that article that I mentioned at the very beginning. Um, about the state of um, where programs, graduate programs, are um, do not feature teaching with primary sources as a fundamental um, skill that people who are graduating from library schools need to have, um, and so there is there is an interest by from my I mean. What I know of is from practitioners who are going, who are looking and saying, um, "This is something that that people need to be trained in, um, rather than training on the job." I, I mean, I also think it's interesting that that many of these jobs that are coming out were, with teaching as as a either as the priority or as um, just a partial um, element of a reference position or a curatorial position. Um, they also tend to be entry-level positions, that they're looking for people with zero to two years of experience, often, not always, but often, um, which also I think is really interesting because I think that there is then a perception all, among people who are maybe writing job descriptions <laughs> that teaching is a skill that you don't have to train for. And I think that's a mistake. Um, I, think that, I think that is doing a disservice to the people who get into those positions and the people, and, and the, the people that we serve. Um, so I think there certainly are some programs that are, are including uh, teaching with primary sources as part of the curriculum, but not enough. Super. Um, Claire Withers asks, if, how, do you include subject librarians or liaisons into the conversation with instructors? 
we we have not done that in our seminar yet. Yeah. Um, but there are there are great examples of that. Um, I mean, I think that there there are places that are that are working towards that model. Um, I mentioned a couple of them: the University of Rochester and Brandeis. I think somebody. I think I saw Chloe um, on the list here from Brandeis, um, who are who are doing that kind of work, who are working really hard to um, collaborate with subject area librarians. Yeah. Uh, Chloe says hi. Uh, <laughs> Rebecca Johnson Melvin says at Delaware they're trying to triangulate special collections and museums with reference and instruction, subject mm -hmm. liaisons and faculty, um, often with um, multiple visits to the library. Mm -hmm. um, and I know at uh, Cornell they've been doing, uh, and, and Yale I think, uh, have been doing um, some work to uh, coordinate special collections, teaching more with uh, kind of mainline um, uh, reference and instruction librarians who think it's a, a, a great practice and something to, to look out mm -hmm. for at mm -hmm. some of our um, institutions. Chela, I think you had a question for Terry. Um, if you're still holding on to that, why don't you uh, go ahead and unmute yourself? Sure. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, Terry, I'm curious, sort of from an administrator's perspective, how you have advocated for the resources for this program and how you're thinking about advocating kind of going forward, what or maybe what has and has not worked in terms of kind of value arguments about this? Sure. Well, um, I, I, I should say that, of course, as, as Senda pointed out, we, we uh, were able to, we just participated in, a, in this grant competition. So our first funding actually came as a result of the internal, uh, internal grant competition. Um, and um, as is the case everywhere, nothing succeeds like success. So one of the things that uh, a, a training seminar does um, is it not only produces instructors who are better collaborators and, in my experience, better teachers, but it also produces evangelists. Um, and so one of the things that, that actually having this happening here does is it, it produces more people who say, wow, that really made a difference in my teaching. Uh, it then allows us to document the fact that it appears to be making a difference in the, um, in the experience of students, although we're still obviously working on perfecting that. Um, but in every way, I think this is a kind of a virtuous circle. So once you start with this face-to-face -face contact, there are many benefits that come from it, and all of those sum to uh, a kind of a, a different uh, position in requesting resources from from a, from a central administration. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, we are just about at time. We've had a lively uh, uh, back channel discussion here in chat um, about a variety of topics, and that's always so great to hear. So as we um, come to a close, I not only want to thank uh, our panelists and our participants for uh, such an engaging um, discussion and conversation, but also to remind all of you that the Works in Progress webinar series is both a place to expose uh, stuff that we're doing in OCLC research, but also, as this is a wonderful example, to expose wonderful work that's happening out there in the field. So if you're doing work uh, that you would like to share in this hopefully lovely supportive environment, or if you know of work that's happening at an institution that you'd like to know more about or have showcased in this format, please do let us know. Uh, Chayla and Mercy and I are always uh, looking out for um, such opportunities and are happy to, um, to host these. So uh, with that, I want to um, conclude today's webinar uh, to thank you, to remind you that this has been recorded and you will be getting a link to that and uh, to sign off. Thank you so much to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.